My name is Eric Mann. I am a senior web engineer with a company called TenUp. We do high-end WordPress development for, well, obviously WordPress. We have several different clients. Uh, we are mainly an agency that focuses on building advanced solutions. We design themes for WordPress. We design some advanced plugins. But part of my job is also heavily involved in working with JavaScript. jQuery is one of my favorite libraries to work with. And if you're in this room, it means that that's probably true for you, too. So the question is, how can we actually test our JavaScript? How can we make our applications more robust so that when they break, they break in ways that we can predict, and they break in ways that are easy to fix? So this is the beginning of my presentation. You can get a link to my slides down there at the bottom. I'm also Eric Mann on Twitter, and I will be retweeting out the slide link in case you guys can't write down that short URL in the amount of time that I've just padded this conversation with so you could write it down. So today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to cover first why you should test, then we're going to talk about how you should test, what you're testing, different tools that you can use to do your testing, how to automate your tests, and then I'm, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually go into a code demonstration and actually show you how things are all put together. There will be some time, a little bit of time for questions at the end, but if anything just completely does not make sense, feel free to throw a shoe at me and I'll stop and try to cover it. So the first question that everybody should be asking is, why do you want to test? Why do you want to write unit tests? There are three things that unit tests help us do. First of all, they help you document your code. How many of us have written code and then come back to it a week later and not known or had the foggiest idea what that code is supposed to do? You all should have your hands up. If you haven't had that experience yet, you're going to. Everybody will write code, you'll do something crafty, you'll do something tricky, you'll do something really inventive, and the code will work. It will be amazing, it will be awesome, the stars will align, unicorns will dance, the world will be a happy, happy place. But if that code breaks, or if you come back to your code in a day or two, and there's a bug in that code, you're left spending just as much time as it took to write the code in the first place, figuring out how the code works so that you can fix the bugs that you've accidentally introduced into the system. Unit testing is a way to explicitly define what your program is supposed to do. This is what my code is supposed to do. These are the inputs this function is supposed to have, and this is what it's supposed to give me back. You write these tests in a scriptable way that you as the developer can read, Junior developers on your team can take a look at it. Senior developers can review your work. Other members of the community can take a look and say, wow, I don't understand how this code actually works, but now I understand what it's supposed to do. Also, you get to verify that functionality. You get to make sure that function do magic actually does magic like it's supposed to do. Once you have this test written, it's not just a tool for the developers to use in a human-readable format to figure out what your fancy code with all of your nested ternary operators does. You now have code that will test your code and make sure that it is actually functioning the way you expect it to, it's returning known values, and if it breaks or throws exceptions in ways that you expect it to, it's actually throwing those exceptions. The third thing that unit tests help us do is document bugs. There's a lot of talk about documentation here, but I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that everybody has faced a bug at some point or another along their career in their code. If you haven't, I want to meet you after this talk. We are hiring, and I would love to work with you. <laughs> but once you have a bug, your client or your customer or an end user says, hey, this thing broke. I tried to log into Gmail, and the banner wasn't there. I tried to use Facebook, and the chat window didn't pop up. Once they give you a bug report, assuming they're a good user and they give you a thorough bug report and explain everything they did from beginning to end, well, first of all, those users don't exist, but you can usually figure out what the user was doing when your code broke. Once you figure that out, you write a test to do exactly what that user was doing when the code broke. If that bug does exist in your code, that test will fail. If you write a test that says, I'm going to do this and then this and then expect this to happen, which is what the user expected to happen, and it doesn't happen, you now have a documented bug, you can fix your code until the test passes, and then you also have protection against that code ever showing up in your code again, because you now have this new test added to your test suite. So 
Unit tests help you document code when you're writing it. They help you figure out what you're doing the morning after when you wake up and don't know what you were looking at. They help you regression test your code in case other bugs show up. It's really a, a generally a good practice to get into. But what do you want to test? A lot of people, when they first get started writing unit tests, want to test everything. So the answer to my question at the bottom, do you test everything? No, you don't test everything. You just test the API that you are exposing for your code to use, for other consumers to use. Basically, any part of your code base that another code base has to talk to is what you want to test. You're also going to want to test changes in state. When you're working with JavaScript and jQuery, you're often working with web pages. So you want to be able to test, when I click this button, did the link really turn red? When I drag this item over here, did a droppable event actually fire? These are different changes of state inside your application, and you can trigger user events and verify that those changes of state actually occur. So to test, so the question of how to, t how to test is basically a question of code awareness. How much do you understand your own code? There are certain best practices that we need to follow when we're writing code, how we scope our variables, how we structure our classes and objects, how we amend to the object prototype. Different ways that we actually put our code together are going to impact how we actually test our code. So I've got a list here. Just be aware of your scope. JavaScript, unlike other languages like Java that people confuse with JavaScript, does have a notion of private variables. You don't explicitly say this is going to be private. You just define it inside a closure. Unlike languages like PHP, Java, C Sharp, and all of these other high, uh, lower level languages, higher level languages, depending on who you talk to, but all of these other code bases give you a reflection API. So when something is declared as private, you can actually make it public, and then you can see what's inside it. In JavaScript, private really is private. If you have a variable or a function or an object defined inside a closure, nothing outside of that closure can see that object. Now, the trick is your tests, your entire unit test suite, is outside of whatever closure you write inside your application. So if, if your entire app.js file is inside a closure and nothing is exposed to the global window object, your unit test can't see any of your code. All it can do is look at what happens to the DOM and make sure that things actually happen to the DOM when they were supposed to. So keeping scope in mind as you're building out your code is hugely important. Also, keeping your globals in mind is important. I mentioned wrapping your entire object in a closure because that's one of the best practices a lot of people use to prevent littering the global namespace. If you start having window dot whatever all over the place, you end up having this huge global state problem where any code can impact the behavior of your application. So wrapping your code inside a closure keeps that nice and tidy. Nobody else can interfere with your application. There was a WebSocket-based video game a friend of mine wrote at one point that he put up on his website and challenged everybody to a duel to see what would happen. He didn't write anything inside a closure, and he lost within five minutes of the duel because people started using the console in Google Chrome to override all of his public objects because nothing was inside a closure. Everything was public. Everything could be modified. You can also end up with a lot of interference. Like I said, I work with a company that focuses on WordPress development. One of the things WordPress does with jQuery is immediately put it into no conflict mode so that the global dollar sign variable is released and it's not alias to jQuery. If you're using global variables like that and you don't wrap it inside closures, you can end up having other people's libraries step all over your code. I've had situations where people have been writing code to depend on jQuery 1.9, which is located first in the header, installing another module that automatically bundled jQuery 1.5 below that and overwriting jQuery. If your code is written in such a way that variables are exposed, you can run into issues there too. You also want to focus on code organization. A best practice that my colleague Carl Danley has kind of top, talked me into is placing all of, all of your libraries and higher order functionality at the top of your page when you're building a web page. And then everything that wires that together, when you're binding event handlers, when you're instantiating objects, all of this code goes at the bottom. This has a couple of advantages. One, it gives you a clear delineation between what code you're writing that is availing certain tools to you and what code you're writing that is using those tools. And second, you can avoid using the document ready event because if all of your code 
your object definitions are at the top of the page and the code that uses them is at the bottom of the page, the DOM has already loaded and you don't need to wait for the DOM to load again. It's already there. Go ahead and Google why you shouldn't use document ready. It can be a slower event for some applications because it defers and waits for certain other things to happen to the page. And sometimes you need to fire before document ready fires, but still after the DOM is loaded. So if you put all of your object code at the top and your functionality code at the bottom, it's going to work just fine. This also helps you by splitting things up, make it easier to unit test. If you have your object and the object instantiation in the same file, in the same location, it's really difficult to break those apart. And I'm actually going to show you a practical example of that when we get to the demonstration. So here is an example, just to reiterate the concept of closures and keeping all of your scope together. This is how a lot of people will write their jQuery code. You have everything wrapped inside a closure, which exposes the window, global, the window global object. It exposes jQuery, passes it in as the dollar sign. And then you bind a click handler to some element on your page and pass in an anonymous function as a callback. This, there's nothing wrong with this code except for one very important thing. You can't test it. You're using an anonymous function here. That anonymous function does not exist anywhere outside of, the outside of the click handler, let alone outside of the closure. So no other code can come in here and call this handler to make sure that the do something awesome is actually doing something awesome. You just kind of have to hope it's there and then manually scan the DOM to see if what you expected to happen actually happens. To rewrite this code, you'd break it out into a couple of, in a couple of different ways. First you would add some sort of a handler object or some sort of a wrapper at the top of your page. And this holds all of the different click handlers you have. You might have hover events. You might have ready events or load events that you need to fire at certain times. Well, you don't necessarily care when you're defining the handler when it fires. So you keep all of the handler code at the top. And then at the bottom of your page, inside a closure, then you can actually wire your handlers up. This gives you the ability to have your code very decoupled. You have your handlers defined in one place, the logic that wires those handlers to actual events in a different place. You don't need to test the bottom portion. You just need to test the top portion. And now you can actually explicitly test window.handlers.clicker and make sure that it actually does, in fact, do something awesome. Now, there are some tools that you can use to actually make this easier. We're working with jQuery here. jQuery has a really nice unit test library called QUnit. It's JavaScript and HTML based. It gives you a really nice page in a browser so you can go through and see how many assertions you put in your code, how many of those assertions passed, how many of those assertions failed, and actually see where they failed, how they failed, and dig deeper into your code. QUnit is open source just like jQuery. It's available. You can get links to it from the jQuery website. You can find it just about anywhere. There are some other unit testing libraries that you can use, but just for now we're going to focus on QUnit. There's also a tool called Phantom. I mentioned QUnit uses HTML to show you in a browser what's going on. That can get really annoying. Unless you are sitting there with a browser open, refreshing the page, refreshing the page, refreshing the page every time you write your code, you aren't going to see when things break. Unit tests are only valuable if you run them multiple times. This is why timers inside unit tests are a bad idea. If it takes a half an hour to run your unit tests, they will be run at most every half an hour while you're writing code. And that's still, once again, only if you remember to run them. So make your tests as easy to run as possible. Phantom is a way to do that. Phantom is a headless WebKit browser. Headless is kind of like the headless horseman. It's there, but you can't see the head. So what Phantom runs on your computer from the command line, it can load regular web pages. You have the entire DOM API. You have the entire JavaScript API available. And you can run your code inside Phantom, see what it does, and then actually get the results of your unit test back out. Also, since we're talking about automation, I want to talk a little bit about Grunt. Who here has used Grunt? OK, for anybody who hasn't used Grunt, it is a node-based task runner. Node.js is a really great local version of a JavaScript-powered web server. You can run it locally. You can run it in the cloud on an actual server to deliver web pages. I run it locally to run Grunt. Grunt gives you the ability to script out tasks and then run them from the command line as often as you want. 
So you can tell Grunt to go through and concatenate your JavaScript files together. You can tell Grunt to minify your JavaScript files. It can run JS Hint, JS Lint, a variety of other tools to make sure that your JavaScript code is sound. It can also run QUnit using Phantom automatically in the background every time you build your code. You can actually tell Grunt, every time I change a file in my project, every time I touch JavaScript and save, I want you to rerun my unit tests. And then as you're coding, as you're working along, every time you make a change, your unit tests get run. And if you introduce a change that breaks your code, Grunt will actually beep at you and throw red code at you and scream and act like it's the end of the world. So who, who hasn't used Grunt but wants to try something with it? OK, good. That's, that's what I wanted to see. Because the next part, we're actually going to make some things go. We're actually going to do a demonstration. So first, I have a couple of different projects here. And you can't really see that, but you can kind of see it enough to get the idea. The first thing you're going to do is we're going to look at a project that I did not write that is already doing unit tests and is doing them very well. Inside this project, you have, this is the JavaScript file. Everything's inside a closure, as it should be. But certain parts of it are actually exposed where it needs to be. So the different object constructors are exposed. Different parts of the code are exposed down here towards the bottom. So window.wp.hooks equals new event manager. Now, outside of this closure, you can look at this object, inspect this object, make sure the object has the functions and the properties that it's supposed to have, and then you can script tests to run against this code. This is what the HTML of QUnit looks like. It's pretty basic. All it has to do is give you a DOM that you can work with. It adds a few different elements on here. You see you have a QUnit header, QUnit banner, QUnit toolbar, all sorts of things that are specific just to QUnit. For this particular project, we aren't actually interacting with the DOM. It's more of a higher level event listener functionality project. But you still need to have the HTML page in order to actually load things up. The tests are, are pretty, pretty basic, but pretty outstanding at the same time. You start with a single test method, give it a description, like what the name of the test is, what it's going to do, and then inside an anonymous callback function, you actually script out what you're going to do. So this first test, add and remove a filter, is going to expect that you have one assertion in your callback. It's going to use window.wp.hooks add filter to add a filter, then it's going to remove the filter, and then it's going to assert that when you apply a filter, you actually get that filter back. Filters are basically just a way to take a string, take a number, take an object, and change what that is. So when you call a filter on a string, you want to be able to manipulate that string in certain knowable ways. This test is making sure that you can add and remove filters using this library the way that you're supposed to. There are, I believe, a total of nine, nine or ten unit tests in this project. Each one is pretty much built the same way. You have a global test method that you add a description, you, then you add a function, and then you call things through. But the magic of this is when you call grunt. So when I call grunt Q unit on this project, it will run through, it loads up phantom.js, loads up the HTML file that you're testing, and then steps through your QUnit test, just like you'd expect, and then tells you that 10 assertions passed. Everything is good. If I come in here and change one of the functions, so in this case, I'm going to say that we expect 21 assertions in this test rather than one assertion. By the way, if you ever have more than five or 10 assertions in a function, you're probably doing something wrong. You want to make your test as small and atomic as possible. Maybe 10 assertions would be OK, but if you start having related functionality that you're all testing in one callback, you're going to end up having too much of your project tied together. And if you break one thing on the left, something on the right is also going to break in new and unexpected ways. And I guarantee you will lose hair over it. But here we go. We're going to rerun QUnit now that we've told it to expect 21 assertions, 21 ass assertions, and it fails and says that one of your tests failed because it was expecting more assertions than you actually had. 
So this is just a demonstration of how a working project actually works with QUnit and Grunt. Now we're going to look at some code that I wrote quite a while ago that was never unit tested and is buggy. And to be perfectly honest, when I started looking at it, trying to figure out what the code did before I prepared this presentation, I had no idea what the code was supposed to do. So once again, going to documentation. Don't be like me, document your code because then when you give a presentation, you will know what your code did. So this is, I'm assuming, a function that exposes a, well, it doesn't actually expose anything. In the entire closure, nothing is exposed to window. You have an image rotator object that is defined inside the closure. It exposes its own methods, preload images, its own preloaded array. So it exposes things inside the closure but none of this information can make it outside the closure. So if you try to run unit tests against this, nothing will work. On top of that, down towards the bottom, the object itself is instantiated, instantiated with properties that came out of the global namespace, and also hooked together with a set timeout, and inside the object itself, it sets a timeout as well. There are several problems with this code. First of all, nothing's exposed. Our unit test can't talk to the code. Our unit test can't talk to the object. We can't see inside the code to see what's going on at all. Secondly, because the object is being instantiated inside the closure, we can't prevent it from being instantiated. When you're writing a test, each test needs to have a new copy of the object. The idea with tests is you should be able to run all of your tests in any order and have them all still pass. If you always have to run test one, and then test two, and then test three, and if you were to swap test two and three and things would fail, then that means your code is too tightly coupled, and you're polluting your, your project with scope. Because once, once you create an image rotator object here, that image rotator object has scope, and that scope will persist from one test to the next test to the next test. So if our first test was to verify that you can add an image to the rotator, and our second test was to verify you could remove an image from the rotator, that would work just fine. We add an image, and then we can remove an image, no error. Once the test, if the code was decoupled, and you started with a new object for each test, you can add an image in the first one, that would be fine. But then when you go to remove an image in the second test, there was no image there to begin with, and you start running into issues. So just try to make sure that your code is as decoupled as possible. So some ways that we could rewrite this code to actually do that. First, we could strip out all of this code here at the bottom, where we define the options, we instantiate the object, and then we start calling methods on the object. We can strip all of that out, place the object definition at the top of the page, place this code that instantiates the object at the bottom of the page. Secondly, we can get rid of the timeouts. You remember how I said something about timeouts and timers take, making your code take forever to run? The way this code is architected, it is meant to fade an image, to rotate images from a background and foreground every eight seconds and take four seconds for the images to rotate. So if you start writing code that's going to test that you can loop through an array of five images and then start over at the beginning of that array, you're now waiting for a minimum of a minute for that one test to run. If you've got 40 of those tests in your code, your tests now take 40 minutes to run. So if you type grunt watch at the command line and tell grunt I want you to rerun my test every time I change something, you're now waiting 40 minutes every time you make a change to your code to find out if you broke anything. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a very fun workflow. So instead, this bottom timer we're actually going to remove because that's going to go into our wire up code at the bottom of the application. This set timeout that we actually call inside the object, we can pull that out and instead throw in a call to a callback. And rather than just allowing you to call fade image, you can say call fade image and pass in a callback. And then after the image is faded, I want you to call this callback. Alternatively, you could just take out any callback and then just call fade image outside of the class on an interval. But I, I don't want to do that because it's less predictable than manually inserting a callback. So here is the code rewritten. The very beginning, we grab a couple of references to some global objects that are in the window, the God object, as some people call it. We have document, because everybody needs to have document. And then we have an options array, which may or may not be set. If it's not set, 
we're going to just assume it's an empty array. We then define our image rotator object, which is almost exactly the same as it was before, except now the fade interval, because we need this externally to actually trigger our timeouts, is exposed on the object. So you could create a new image rotator object and then specify the fade interval property of that object. We also come now down to the fade image function, which once again, we're now passing in a callback. And if that callback is set, then after we fade, we fire the callback. So this way, we aren't manually setting a timeout inside our object because we don't want our object to manage its own state. The object should not have any concept of what state is going on. And that's basically how you rewrite the object. But up at the top, you can see rather than just declaring image rotator as a local variable, we also pass it out to window.imageRotator. So now we can get a copy of the object out of the global scope. I have scripted a few tests here just to kind of give you an idea of how it works. First of all, we're going to create an array which just has two images in it. I figured two images would be sufficient to show what's going on. Our first test has six assertions. The very first thing we do is we create a new copy of our object. And then we pass in this new image array that we have because we want to start with known data, a known input, and then check what outputs the code gives us so we can verify that it's behaving the way we expect it to. Our very first test is to test that images are preloaded. So we create the new image rotator, and then we verify that first, no images have been preloaded because we haven't told the object to preload the images. So we set an assertion to verify that the preloaded array is empty. Then we act on the, on the object, and we tell it, OK, now preload the images that you have in your internal array. Then we verify again that now there are actually two preloaded images populated in this object. And then finally, we make sure that those pre preloaded images are actually the object, objects we would expect to exist inside the collection. They could just be strings. They could be numbers. In this case, we're creating a new instance of the image object in the JavaScript API. The idea for that is we can create the image object and then assign the source for that object and preload the image into the browser so that your users don't sit there and wait for it to load line by line if it's a PNG or fade in if it's an interlaced graphic. Just a couple more tests that we have in here. I think there are a total of nine assertions. I'm not going to go through them all. Just a few to actually show how different state is managed. Another part of the object, the part that actually does the magic when it fades the images, it does so by setting the background image of the bottom layer to be what the background image of the top layer was. Then it fades out, gets rid of the top layer, replaces it with the next image in the rotation, and then fades it onto the screen. This way, you don't end up with a random blink of unstyled background or anything like that if you're fading two images in and out at the same time. Instead, you always have a static image there, and you're just fading an image on top of it, so you get a smooth transition. We want to verify that that's actually happening. We, we want to make sure that the background image is taking the top image's background, and then we want to make sure that things are fading out appropriately. So our next test is actually going to use this jQuery, this QUnit fixture. So we're actually going to build an HTML document for QUnit. We're going to give it a div with an ID, and a couple of spans with classes that we want to work with. The div is going to have an ID of rotating images. We're going to have a span with top image and a span with bottom image. Don't worry about the styling at this point. We just need to make sure that the DOM actually responds to document get element by ID the way it's supposed to. So we start out with that. Our rotate, rotation div is the document element with the ID of rotating images. The top image is the top layer. The bottom image is the bottom layer. We set the top image to actually be, I think this is the logo for the jQuery Portland event. And we set the bottom image to have no background. We then create a new image rotator object, which is the thing that we're actually testing. Pass in, once again, our known array of images. And then we tell it to fade an image. We don't need to worry about preloading right now. We've already tested preloading. Now we want to test the fade image method. So we call fade image. And when we call fade image, we know that the bottom layer should now have the 
the image source that the top layer used to have, and the top layer should now have the, the image source that was the first image in our array. So that's what we do is we test first that the bottom image has the image that it's supposed to have. It originally started with none, and then we're just verifying that it now has the image that the top layer had before. Like I said, there are several different tests in this test suite. This is actually a live project that I'm using, so writing unit tests for it was kind of a breath of fresh air. When we run grunt Q unit on it, has to be everything has to be lowercase apparently. It pulls in our HTML file and then runs our tests. We had a total of 12 assertions in the entire test document and it ran through and actually ran all of them and did them all without error. Now like I said, we have those couple of parts in the code that actually had timeouts, which could also be set interval. And for that one, we actually had to specify more arguments to the array. So we had to tell it fading is actually set up to use a jQuery method to fade the image in. Top.fadeIn is going to fade at a duration of 1,000 times whatever value you pass in. The default value is four. So if you don't specify anything, this test, any test that calls the fade image function is going to take four seconds to run. Now we actually do have one test that's going to call fade image at least three times because we're checking to make sure that the, when it loops through the array, it restarts at the beginning of the array. So it calls fade image, makes sure that the image is right, calls fade image again, makes sure the image is right, calls fade image again, you kind of get the point. But if each of these times it calls fade image, it's going to take four seconds. You now have a single test that's going to take 12 seconds to run every time you run it, otherwise it's going to fail. So instead, you, you pass in a known timer. You pass in a fade of 0.1 times 1,000 is 100 milliseconds. So rather than taking four seconds to run, it now runs in 100 milliseconds. And you can't quite see it, but it took 227 milliseconds for our 12 tests to actually run. And this now tests our object. We can now verify what you can see by looking at the tests, what the code is supposed to do. I can come back to this project now in another six months and know what I intended to do with the object Anybody else comes into the project is going to know exactly what the project is supposed to do, what the class is supposed to do, how it's supposed to function. And if there are any bugs introduced, we can rerun our unit test to make sure that nothing broke. So now at this point, I do want to open it up if anybody has any questions. I will try to repeat the questions back so that people can hear it over the microphone, but go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes. Okay, so the question was some people would argue that writing unit tests is writing code to test your code and that even though the tests exist to help you understand what the code is doing, you could just read the code yourself. Is that right? The idea of writing unit tests is that somebody else could write the test for your code. So you could have another engineer in your company actually design the project and say, we need an object that does X, Y, and Z. And they could actually script out the method signatures and say the object is going to be called this and it needs to have these methods, and these methods need to have this behavior. Then they could hand that over to another developer who can actually implement those methods. You don't have to be the same person who writes the tests and the code, and it's actually better if you're not, because if you're writing the code, and then you write the test to test your code, you might miss things. But if you have another person documenting this is what the code is supposed to do, you just have to write enough code to pass that test. Once you've written that code to pass that test, you can then refactor your code to make it more performant. When I actually wrote this code originally, I think I had three nested for loops in the part that preloaded images, which is really non-performant, but it passed the test. After I made sure that the code passed the test, I went back through and refactored the code until I got it down to one for loop, and it was much more performant, but it still passed the same test, which just means it fits the same API. 
It exposes the same methods and has the same behavior as the code that I originally had there. It's just faster. So once you start writing tests, even though you're writing code to test your code, you're writing code to test code that you may or may not understand the implementation of. The unit tests are just defining the functionality, not the implementation. You could implement this any way you wanted to. You saw that I had inside the jQuery selector document get element by ID a couple of times. You could just write dollar pound sign element rather than dollar document get element by ID element. It the implementation can differ, but as long as it still passed the test, both code solutions are actual implementations of the same issue. Does that make sense? OK, great. Yes? So the question is, do you write your unit test first or do you write your code first? Ideally, you will be writing your unit test first. It's the idea of test-driven development because you have the scope of a project, you know what the project's supposed to do, what outcomes it's supposed to have, what behavior it's supposed to have. You write the tests and then say, okay, now we need to build a system that passes these tests. In reality, that can double the amount of time that you're spending writing code. It doesn't always, usually when you have the test written, it triggers immediately in your head, oh, I know exactly how I could write this. So it actually doesn't take much more time. But often unit testing is a step that is skipped by developers because we just want to ship product out the door. And when that happens, you end up having to write unit tests after the fact and then refactor your code to actually make it testable, which is what I did in this situation. I had written the code months ago and had not written unit tests and had to actually refactor it just to make it testable. Okay, I'm gonna ask, look for a question over here. Yes. Have I used Jasmine and how does it compare to QUnit? I have used Jasmine. I really like Jasmine. One of my coworkers actually asked me if I was going to be talking about Jasmine today. Jasmine is just another framework you can use for testing. It is more about scripting behavioral tests. So it's slightly different than scripting unit tests. It's also a little bit more human readable. If you write Ruby at all, Jasmine is actually a lot easier to comprehend than QUnit. So it's just kind of a, a different flavor, something else that you can experiment with. I saw a hand over here, yes? How do you tell your unit test what HTML to use? With QUnit, there's actually, let me show you in the directory. With QUnit, you actually have a test directory and inside this test directory, you have libs. In this libs directory, I have QUnit itself and jQuery, just so I can make references to it locally. You have the QUnit test.js, which is the script file that I'm telling Grunt to run. And that is also referencing QUnit test.html. So QUnit test.html is basically you just tell Grunt, this is the HTML file I want to run. You could just as easily open this QUnit test file in a browser. And this one currently fails. But this is what QUnit looks like inside the browser rather than inside Grunt. So you specify the HTML file. You can call it QUnit test. You can call it test. You can call it whatever you want. And then inside your Grunt file, when you're scripting Grunt, you tell it, this is where my tests live. And then it runs that way. Yes? Any strategies for refactoring large projects? One bit at a time. It's really when the project gets to a certain size, it becomes almost unmanageable. I worked with a team that had not heard of unit testing at all, and their project was, I think, two and a half million lines of code. And it was a 10-year legacy project. We started writing unit tests, and when I finally left that company, they were up to something like 3,500 unit tests for it, and it was about 3% of the code base was covered by unit tests. So it's really, if you have an established project that's very large, the best rule of thumb is to just start writing unit tests for new code and try to, don't make it a hard rule, but just kind of make it a, a guideline that no new code goes into the code base unless it has tests. And then once you have all of your new code with tests and your team starts becoming more and more adept at writing tests, you can go back in and say, well, now we need to retest these new projects. So it's essentially, if you have a code base, every time you touch it moving forward, you have to write tests before you can write new code for it. Even if that's refactoring code that already exists to fix a bug, you still have to write tests for it. Yes? Yes? 
have I found a way to create mocks for things, an efficient way to create mocks for things that depend on AJAX requests? I haven't really looked too much into that. A lot of times, because I'm running with a local environment, I will just stub out whatever API it is I'm pushing against and then allow it to actually make the AJAX request. But there are mocks out there for that. I think we have time for one more question in the very back. Can you write tests to test like if one of the images didn't load that it would cancel that? Yes, you can. Uh, one of the type of tests that I did not go into is the idea of testing exceptions. So you can actually script your code in such a way to trigger errors and test that your code fails in the way that you expect it to. So in a situation like this, if you have an array where one of the items is not a URL to an image or is a URL to a broken image or is perhaps an object rather than a string, you might say, if this happens or if this image fails to load, I want the program to do this. And then you write a test to verify when the program fails, it will do this. And then you just refactor your code until it passes that test. But yes, you can script exceptions into JavaScript unit tests. You can do it in pretty much any language for unit tests. OK, that's all I have for you all. Thank you for coming out. I hope you're enjoying the jQuery conference. I hope you all had a great lunch. Thank you.